Okay, hello everybody and welcome. This is Effective Altruism for Christians, a guest speaker event with Thomas Kelly on the topic of kidney donation. Welcome, Thomas. Uh, it's nice to have you here. Thanks, Lisa. I'm happy to be here. Yeah, uh, can you first tell us a bit about yourself? Like, you know, who are you and and, and so forth? Uh, sure. And, and, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, so my name is Thomas Kelly. I currently teach political science at a liberal arts college in Ohio. Uh, I donated my kidney back in 2014 when I was a graduate student at UC Berkeley. Um, I got, to be honest, my involvement with effective altruism mostly came through kidney donation. Like I was like exposed to some of the, those ideas kind of like almost inadvertently. Like um, I occasionally read like less wrong and overcoming bias, which are like loosely connected uh, websites, just like in college and grad school out of personal interest. Uh, I even read on this now defunct utilitarian forum, Philosophia. So it's kind of like uh, familiar with some of the ideas that led into it um, while it was kind of like very embryonic. Um, and at the same time, I, um, I, did, I converted to Christianity as an adult. I was baptized as a child, um, for my, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't say I was like raised Christian. Um, so that's kind of like my intellectual, like, I don't know, mini biography. Uh, and in graduate and in college, I had been interested in kidney donation, but like really like in an abstract, like public policy debate. Like I remember reading about people who claimed that switching to an opt out system in the United States, and a lot of these references are going to be very America centric. Um, would like arguably increase the kidney donation rate, or I was familiar with the debate that if like you compensated people who donated their kidney, you would like probably drive a really dramatic increase in kidney donation. So it's always in the back of my mind that this was like a interesting like bioethical topic, and I would like think of it now and then just from like I don't know thinking about public policy. Um, later in graduate school, I was started to become like more interested in like I don't know like doing something positive for others that made more direct impact than just academic research. Um, and I guess I was percolating in my mind. And at the same time, I was becoming um, interested in Christianity and considering it seriously. So I really hesitate. And like, uh, I wrote a blog for this on the EA for Christians blog a while ago. But I hesitate to make a causal claim that like, I converted to Christianity was like, in, like inspired to help people. It was like, I don't know for sure that's true. And I know like atheists, <laughs> kidney donors who have pretty similar stories to me. But at the same time, it seems really bad to like be like, oh, like, um, it wasn't an influence at all. So like, uh, it was kind of concurrent. Um, and then I guess uh, my further involvement came with this is I just started writing people who were already involved in the sphere being like, hey, like is kidney donation useful? Like uh, is trying to increase kidney donation arguably like, um, I don't know, can it compete with other effective altruist like goals, right? Which at that time, um, it, there was already diversity, but I think at the time back in 2014, more people proportionately were like focused on uh, developing world health and like kind of less of an emphasis overall on like X risk or uh, animal welfare, although those elements have always been, I think, an important issue. Um, and so I decided to donate my kidney in 2014 and I uh, took a, a little time off school to help get a nonprofit started, Weightless Zero, that's an advocacy group for uh, increased kidney donation. Um, at that time, I wrote uh, with Josh Morrison, another kidney donor, an argument that for an individual EA, uh, kidney donation is like a reasonable choice um, in terms of like other things you can do to help the world. And I still think that case holds up pretty well, but I think the framing is important. We said reasonable choice and that's like how I want to present it today, because there's lots of people who from like uh, an effective altruist perspective can do things that seem to like outcompete kidney donation pretty clearly. So I think it's something that like a lot of people should, should consider. Um, and I think for the population as a whole, like almost everyone should like donate their kidney versus like what else they're going to do in the next like three weeks or however long it takes them to recover. But for effective altruists who are like seriously weighing their options of what the best use of their time is, the trade-offs are like pretty unclear. And so for like a, a meaningful share of effective altruists, I wouldn't say it's like their best option. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so that's interesting. So you're not necessarily advocating for kidney donation to everybody in effective altruism. Yeah, I think that's fair to say. Like, I definitely mm, think there's some mm. people who, like, I would say, like, uh, it's awkward because I feel like I never want to say don't do it because, like, uh, the benefit to the recipient is, like, pretty dramatic. Like, a living kidney, like, um, you know, estimates differ, but, like, you know, like, it will probably last 10 to 20 years. The quality of life for someone with a 
kidney transplant is way better than being on dialysis and they live longer. So it's such an obvious immediate gain. Mm, mm. Um, but for, I, I think it really, I think like that for some people, the opportunity costs are like pretty substantial. Mm. Um, yeah, yeah, definitely. I was also curious that you said that uh, you came, did I hear you correctly, but you said that you some somewhat like came to effective altruism uh, through kidney donation. Yeah, so it, this is, is um, I think that's fair to say, it's like the, how I met anyone involved with this program. So like when I would like read people writing about it, it was like, I agree intellectually, like, you know, I'd like read about like give well ranking charities and I'm like, that's great. <laughs> like, mm. you mm. know, very enthusiastic about the overall topic. Um, but yes, my introduction was it was something I go to email people and I like um, then met through it uh, different people, like some people who at the time worked um, like kind of for the Open Philanthropy Give Well project. Mm -hmm. um, and like I heard about the first EA summit, which was much smaller than it is now uh, in Oakland. And I like attended and like talked with some people about mm -hmm. this idea. So that's how I first met anyone in the real world or even digitally connected to EA was saying like, hey, here's like a a separate issue area, maybe it's worthwhile. Um, hmm. Yeah, that's cool. That's a pretty unusual way to enter effective altruism, I think. <laughs> Though you had some like previous exposure to, as, as you mentioned, like less strong and overcoming bias and, and, and stuff like that. So, so yeah, but that's really, that's definitely interesting. Yeah, yeah. So um, just one more question before mo moving into the actual like kidney donation. Uh, you said that you're not quite sure that there's a connection like about the connection between your christian faith and and your donation but i think like like if you look at it i i think there's a pretty obvious like even if it wasn't obvious for you personally but i think like personally it's hard hard to think of things that are like more uh straightforwardly christ-like than donating your kidney to a stranger <laughs> I think, so I think that's something I disagree with you on. So like not necessarily when it comes to me, right? I think it's mm. like really bad for a Christian to say like, I did something and like God had nothing to do with it or like to deny like the fruits of the spirit. That seems like a very bad attitude to have. And I don't want to like imply I'm suggesting it. Um, but I think, I think there are a lot of people who have done way better things than donating their kidney. And I think there's a lot of people who have done way more sacrificial things than donating mm. their kidney. And some people hit both of those categories. So as someone who's gone through, as someone who's gone through it, I think it's one of those things that's like an unusual choice, but not that big of a choice. Mm. Like, I think the sacrifice is not really that big for most people. Okay, that, that might be a reasonable way to look at it. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. But yeah, let's, let's get to the uh, specifics. Like, what exactly did you do? And, and how did you do it? <laughs> sure. So like, um, okay, so th these are going to be um, more directly relevant, maybe for other Americans who are listening. Um, but in general, when you donate a kidney, the most common way is like you donate a kidney to someone you know who needs one, right? Um, that's by far the vast majority. Um, uh, another way is to just like donate to an individual stranger. You could like contact, at least in the, America, in the United States, a transplant center and say like, hey, I want to donate a kidney. And they'll say like, okay, we have a patient here who's like a good biological match, we'll take your kidney. A third way is to do what's called like pair donation. So this originally, um, and still largely exists as almost like a, a, a form of kidney training, uh, trading. So imagine like I was friends with like Vesa and I had still had a spare kidney, but like my kidney was like the wrong uh, blood type or a poor match otherwise. I, and I couldn't give to Vesa. I could give to say like, um, I don't know, like John's brother and then John could give to Vesa. So essentially you'd trade. Uh, a donor gives a kidney in exchange for like their friend or family member or community member getting a kidney back. If you don't have someone who you want to particularly help, you donate, um, I don't to a third person, I don't know, like Sarah in exchange for like, and Sarah will donate to her neighbor. And then like, um, or excuse me, so like if I would, I would donate to one person, their friend or family member would donate to a second recipient and their friend or family member would donate to a third recipient. Uh, sometimes these chains can be very long. Uh, sometimes they can be really short. Um, so the benefit to this is like your, the main benefit is actually like you're giving a kidney to one specific person. The other benefit is if more people are willing to like donate kidneys to the pools of these possible pairs, uh, the people who, did, uh, there's a broader pool of kidneys to be matched with more people. So they can essentially get like better um, matches like biologically, right? They can get like closer to the ideal kidney for the ideal recipient. Um, can I ask a question but, about the compatibility there? Yeah. So, you have 
person's A, B, and C, let's just say it's a three-person chain, and A is incompatible with C, but you're saying that sometimes you can donate to person B, and A and B is compatible, and B and C is compatible, but like A and C is incompatible? Uh, yeah, so the way it works is, so at least in the United States, there's a lot of people who are interested in doing this. So there's a pretty broad pool of possible matches that can be made. So if you need a kidney and you have someone who's willing to donate a kidney on your behalf, um, you're very, very likely to get a kidney then. Because there's like such, there's enough pool of potential donors to draw from who are willing to trade kidneys. Um, and then when there's a non-directed donor, so someone who's donating a kidney but doesn't need one back for a particular person, the organization that facilitates this can say like, like what missing chain will like trigger or facilitate the most additional donations. Um, did I misinterpret your question, Alex? Well, I'm, I'm wondering how in any given chain, how yeah, yeah. like the big, how the beginning and end, they couldn't just do a direct donation but but like going through intermediaries somehow they are they are able to do a like a donation that's mutually compatible with blood type or whatever okay so so it's not for like any given pair right so the i think the way to think about it is like um a bunch of so if you just had one don't one potential donor and one potential recipient uh, the, the donation would only happen if they were compatible. Now let's say they're not compatible, but another incompatible pair enters. The only way the donation could happen is if donor one is compatible with like recipient two and donor two is compatible with recipient one. But as you add more and more potential donors and potential recipients in, eventually it becomes pretty easy to find potential trades because there's enough people willing to enter into this. Okay, I think that makes sense. Yeah, thanks. And, okay, okay. Yeah. and if you have someone who doesn't need a kidney back, then their, their kidney can be like kind of plugged in anywhere into the system. Um, like, they can say like, if, uh, and then at the end of the chain, the, the final kidney will just go to someone who doesn't have anyone willing to donate on their behalf. Okay, sweet, thanks. Mm -hmm. Maybe we could check another, now that we started, started answering some questions. The, I noticed there's a question in the chat that uh, might be sort of related. Maybe we can tackle that a bit later on, but I'm just going to read it now. Uh, is it an either or? What is the time cost to you? And this was asked uh, a little earlier. So uh, I believe you were, we were talking about mm -hmm. the, yeah, the costs or, or the benefits. So, okay, for any individual, I can't tell you if for you this is in like opportunity cost. Right? That's a, yeah. It's in either or. Like, there's some people who like maybe they're like, I donate X thousand dollars per year, no matter what, and if I donate a kidney, that won't affect my donations. Um, that and that's probably the easier case to make a comparison. If it's someone who's like working directly on a cause, it's hard to say like how much value do their their works on like, I don't know, really impactful research or activism matter, right? That's maybe a trickier question. Um, in terms of time cost, uh, the biggest one is going to be the recovery period. Uh, transplant centers say prepare to spend up to six weeks recovering. Um, that's very long. Most people who like have office jobs don't need that. I would say I needed three weeks to like feel fully recovered. That's like typical of people like me who like donated like young and had like very sedentary jobs. Um, so there were, but you are losing several weeks where like you, you know, aren't going to be like productive economically. Um, I think that actually the opportunity costs, at least for Americans are a little, for Americans who are like earning to give are a little lower now, because if you donate through the National Kidney Registry, um, which is the main organization that facilitates their donors, they'll reimburse your lost wages. Um, so in, in the short term, you can you should be able to avoid direct financial costs. That said, you can still say, so, someone could, I think, reasonably say something like, hey, three weeks won't affect my income in this year, but maybe it will like delay my time to promotion or like delay my time on a really time sensitive research project or uh, interfere with a job search, right? So 
even if you live in America where you're like direct salary loss or wages can be reimbursed, or if you work for an employer who's uh, who might give you paid time off for something like this, I don't think that like fully eliminates the opportunity cost, right? For some people it might, right? Like if you don't work over the summer, if maybe like you're a teacher or um, you have a very predictable job where like taking three weeks off won't affect your trajectory, then like the opportunity cost is arguably fairly low currently. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a situation where I think, I think it's like a really individual evaluation. Yeah, that point about uh, being like having your salaries reimbursed is actually quite significant because one of the criticism criticisms I recall seeing in the in the EF forum post comments was that it would actually, according to some apparently pretty high earning people, uh, that, that, that they thought that it would be worth more to just work uh, that time and donate uh, all the income from that time period. But but that actually changes changes it quite a lot. Yeah, there is an income cap on how much the National Kidney Registry will yeah, reimburse yeah. for you. So we're really high earning people. I, I think it is a very like reasonable point to say like it would be better for me to, mm, to work. Yeah, of, of course, like yeah. very high earning. But I think it yeah. wasn't like that's they were talking something about like two thousand dollars or or something like that, uh, which I think probably still falls into the reimbursement yeah, uh -huh. range. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah it, it is true. I think we live in a world with like pretty effective opportunities to donate. Um, like if we didn't, it'd be easy to say like, yeah, donate your kidney. The cost to you is like low relative to the benefit. But if we like, I don't, I, I have a lot of respect for give well. Um, I take their estimates pretty seriously. So like a, a fairly small donation, you can argue is going to like yield or protect as many qualities as a kidney donation. I do think that's the best. I think that's the strongest counter consideration for mm. uh, mm. fact about others thinking about this. Yeah, but then there are these uh, less tractable, less tangible or less quantifiable benefits like uh, maybe forming your own identity around like, you know, sort of like self-signaling to yourself that, hey, I really am a altruistic person who's ready to go to rather, you know, who's ready to sacrifice and something like that. Uh, though it's very hard to estimate like how how big these benefits are. Yeah, and I think that one is almost like a double-edged sword. Yeah, definitely, like, definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you want to talk um, a little more about that. Yeah, so I think, um, okay, so I, I think most people should donate their kidney, and I think even a lot of effective altruists should like seriously consider it. Um, I think for like Christian effective altruists, there's maybe like a potential risk that like secular effective altruists might um, not have. So like, if you're a secular effective altruist, like one thing you hear people are, worry a lot about is like, hey, like, should I donate now or later? And some people say you should donate now because what if 10 years you like, you cease to be altruistic or like less altruistic, right? And so like with your kidney, you can say like, yeah, if you give it now, you can't take it back. Like it's an irrevocable, uh, you can't revoke it. Um, but I think if you think maybe more in terms of virtue ethics or you're more like, hey, like it's really important to me to persist as like a disciple of Jesus until I die. Then like the idea like, oh, I need to like quick do good now because I might be bad later. seems like a, a strange consideration to have. Um, the other thing is maybe a little, uh, a potential downside of kidney donation. And I almost like hate to cite any psychology because of the replication crisis. And in a year, people might be like, why did you cite that? <laughs> there, but I'm going to anyways. There is a concept sometimes called like moral licensing or like self-licensing and the idea is like, if you do something good, then use it to rationalize being bad. And I do think it's kind of easy to think that like, oh, I gave away my kidney. And it's something where like, it has a clear endpoint. You can only do it once. And then kind of like, almost like rest on your laurels. Like, should I help someone? And you'd be like, I should, but I already donated my kidney. Whereas like someone who's like, donating a lot of money from giving what we can or maybe like tithing to their local church I feel like it's hard for them to say to themselves I did that five years ago I can just stop and still like feel good about myself but with kidney donation I think you can turn it into like your an identity to like feel like I'm good like I've just mm. charged my obligations so ah uh, you know yeah uh, yeah so maybe yeah. maybe in some way you could say that there's there's a kind of like a temptation of almost like pride there also yeah. or maybe it's the same thing in a bit different guys yeah 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 like thinking like okay now i'm basically a saint because i donated my kidney and then yeah <laughs> yeah yeah the, yeah that's an interesting point that's really like a this kind of a difference between like secular ea and, and christian christian ea here though i guess secular ea would also be quite concerned about moral licensing mm-hmm 
at least to some degree if it's mm -hmm. at least if it affects your like <laughs> donations or, or career choices or something like that yeah but yeah i was thinking before uh uh, before Alex's question, I was going to ask you about like how the process itself was for you. Sure. If you mind um, quickly sharing. Like... Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm happy to. Um, and once again, this is uh, it, it might be different in other countries, um, but in the United States, uh, if you want to donate through a a chain donation, pair donation, there's a few organizations to do it. There's the National Kidney Registry, there's the Alliance for Pair Donation, and there's the United Network for Organ Sharing. Um, and essentially they work with different hospitals. So you can contact one of them and they say, if you want to donate through us, here's like a nearby ho a hospital that will evaluate you. Medically, each hospital transplant center, they will decide if they want to, uh, if they want to take your kidney. So they assess you physically, um, they assess you for like mental health issues. And, and in the United States, they also have a social worker interview you and see like this will maybe have like less uh, quantifiable downsides. So it's called an independent living donor advocate. And essentially she'll ask you questions like, will this cause you to like mm, have problems with your family or friends? Is this contrary to your like philosophical or religious values? Um, <laughs> are you going to like lose your dream career because of this? Um, and they're much more concerned about someone donating a kidney who shouldn't than the lost value to the recipient who's getting one. So they're kind of looking to screen you out. Not, um, and so they look for like standard reasons why you're unhealthy or reasons why you might need your second kidney, right? Because you do lose some kidney function, which is not good for you. It's not a serious health downside, but it is a downside if you already have signs of either having kidney disease or if you're at high risk of having kidney disease in the future, that might be one reason they turn you down. Uh, some people also just have like weirdly shaped kidneys or some abnormality, which might not be bad for them, but just makes the surgeon not want to like try to uh, remove it or transplant it. Um, uh, and so you essentially go through many screenings and it can take a while and then they either can say yes or no. Um, I was actually, and so, um, while they have common considerations, it's a very discretionary process. I was actually rejected at my first transplant center and I was shocked. Um, and they said they felt like I was too young, even though I was like 26 or 27 when I started the screening process, so not that young. And um, they were like, yeah, we just want you to like wait another year to make sure you're sure. Um, so I asked for them to transfer my medical records to another center and um, uh, passed there, but there's nothing like physically wrong with me. <laughs> and then uh, a few months later, uh, one downside of trying to donate through a chain is that the logistics are more complicated. So it can take longer to schedule. That's another downside. Um, so some people have very rigid schedules. That's a reason why kidney donation might be less attractive or they might be more inclined to just donate to an individual rather than trying to start a chain. Um, uh, I don't know, the, surg the surgery happened. I was in the hospital, I believe for two nights for the first week afterwards, I was on prescription painkiller and I was sleeping all the time. For the next week I was on um, just over the counter painkiller. And at the end of the third week, like I felt pretty normal. Like I went and played tennis with my friends. Like I was pretty bad at it, but like I felt like I had full energy at least for the purposes of working. Um, so that's like, I, maybe I ran through that too quickly, Faisa. Uh, that's like the top down level of what happened. Okay. Yeah. 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 And the process itself was like, yeah. So, so it sounds like it wasn't, as, as you said earlier, like it wasn't a major, uh, like, you know, you, you got over it pretty quickly considering it's still like major surgery. Yeah. yeah. And apparently most people do like, even, even if it's quite invasive procedure, it's still not like it's still yeah. we're talking about a few weeks of recovery usually mm -hmm. and not like months yeah 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 you mentioned you were 20 26 at that time 27 uh mm -hmm. what is the best age to donate a kidney there's a question in the chat so oh, that's a really good question so on one hand the best age for an, the donor is probably maybe when they're older because um most people who donate will never run into kidney problems but you have a much better picture of your lifetime risk of having kidney disease when you're 50 than when you're 25, right? If you're 25, like you might think like maybe I'll get diabetes, type two diabetes. If you're 50, you could still develop it, but you probably have a better idea of that's likely. Um, if you're 20, like you probably like 
you might not know if in your 40s, 50s, or 60s, you're going to have high blood pressure or not. If you're older, you will. So from the individual's perspective, older lets you better estimate your risk. Um, there is some evidence that like younger people's kidneys like work somewhat better when transplanted. I don't think the difference is huge. Like the bigger difference is like a kidney from a living donor is way better than a kidney for, is, is meaningfully better. I don't overstate than a kidney from a deceased donor. Um, I think the other thing is, I guess like this is getting more speculative. I'm optimistic that in the future there won't be kidney donation in that like either or it will be much less needed in that general improvements in medical technology, whether we're talking about miniature dialysis, uh, maybe in the long run, artificial organs or more uh, xenotransplantation from animals. Um, so like, I don't know, I hope in 40 years, people aren't, knock on wood, people still aren't donating their kidneys to other humans, but there is some risk to it. Yeah, yeah. Now that we're talking about like uh, problems or or the process itself, there's a question in the chat about uh, what are physical problems that might screen you out. The biggest ones are things that are kidney disease or signal kidney disease, high blood pressure, uh, being extreme, being very overweight. I'm not saying like I wasn't, I was not, and I'm not like super fit, like I know, you know, um, but being very overweight, having high, a really high blood pressure that's not managed well. Um, having, uh, I don't know, any really diagnosed kidney problems. Some things that you might screen, screen you out don't necessarily. For instance, even HIV positive people can donate. They simply donate to other people who are HIV positive. Um, so, so the big ones, the most common things that would screen you out are like diabetes or really high blood pressure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, what about mental problems? Because that's, I think that's fairly relevant because the, in my experience, the effective altruism community has its own, own fair share of people struggling with mental, mental uh, health issues. So you are, you do speak to a psychiatrist. The emphasis there more so is like um, basically basic cognitive function chat tests. Like I will read this to you, read it backwards. So I, I don't think someone would be like denied just because they have like um, maybe an diagnosed anxiety disorder or depression, but the transplant center essentially has tons of discretion. So I wouldn't say like, uh, um, I wouldn't, if you're on an antidepressant that wouldn't like not automatically preclude you from donating or like, I don't know, but you can go through like therapy for like OCD or general anxiety disorder would not automatically prevent you. Um, but I, I, I don't, I don't want to like make more specific claims. It's, mm -hmm. Mm. All very discretionary. Yeah, I see. I think we could uh, start wrapping this up soon in the sense that we'll turn the recording off. Uh, before that, I'd like to ask you uh, one final question. Can you tell a bit about Waitlist Zero? Sure. Um, so Waitlist Zero uh, started in 2014. Um, it's, I'm still on the board, but I, I'm um, so I serve for uh, for as a volunteer capacity. Um, it's it's a uh, it's primarily. Um, an advocacy nonprofit. So we do work such as um, uh, educating legislators, uh, participating in public comment periods about federal regulation, about living kidney donations. Um, there is, uh, and uh, supporting some like legislative, uh, occasionally supporting uh, policy changes that would offset some of the cost of kidney donation. Um, mm. uh, Josh Morrison, if any of you know him, is the current executive director. Uh, he also runs um, One Day Sooner which is um, a vaccine acceleration on profit. That's also kind of in the EA sphere. Mm -hmm. Okay. Hey, thank you so much, Thomas. It's been very nice talking with you and, and so interesting hearing about all this. Mm -hmm.